This week on the Sunday Glide, we're going to step through the drop knee turn, the most common mistakes, how to fix these, and how to implement the drop knee turn into your own surfing. Um, so just very quickly before we get into the video, I just want to say a massive thank you for the, the support from this community from the last video. Um, so everyone who's put in an interest for uh, getting some of the merchandise, the, uh, the wheels are in motion. Um, so it'd be great to get that out soon. And then for everyone who also donated through the, uh, through the buy me a coffee um, link, which you've put in the description of these videos, which is just a donation page. Um, so if you do want to support, but you don't want any of the merchandise, then that's a, that's a way that you can uh, do that as well. I'm super excited um, for the, this WSL contest to get underway, heading up there um, Saturday week. And uh, yeah, it should be good. So I'm, I'm blown away by all of the support from you guys. So um, again, it means a lot for everyone who's been in contact with me and, and supporting in that way. So what we'll do now is we're gonna go through a quick edit uh, for the drop knee turns so um, I just want you to I guess pay attention to the drop knee turns in particular the different ways that they're used and the different kind of uh, styles and the positions that we come into for the drop knee turn and then we're going to do a big uh, deep dive into that as well I'm um, so breaking down the different components there which should be a bit of fun and then at the end we'll go through tip time as usual so uh, yeah let's get straight into it going to get into now is the drop knee turn. So I think this is a really fundamental uh, surfing turn. It's very unique. It's something that I think we should take in our pride as longboarders and, and try and learn. Um, so I think today we'll go through a little step-by-step -step guide as to through coaching um, everyone, uh, the mistakes that I see the most and how to go about beginning the drop knee turn and making sure we're doing the right things. Um, and understanding if things are going wrong, why they might be going wrong as well. So the first thing that we're gonna step into uh, is looking at the stance. So for the stance, what we actually notice is with a normal uh, stance on a surfboard, um, we typically have our feet parallel to the, to the stringer, so, or diagonal across. 
Um, this is really, really important to make sure we've got the heel toe mechanism. So if we have the feet uh, or the, the heel on the toe along the stringer, um, this gets rid of a lot of our balance and we can't use our heels and toes to deviate our weight from one side of the rail to the other side of the rail, which as we know is super important for our turning. But what we need to do for our drop knee turn uh, particularly is make sure uh, that we actually come into a position where our front foot is still going to be angled across the stringer and our back foot is actually now going to be positioned with the heel and the toe along the stringer. And the biggest thing that we also need to consider is that the stance needs to be very, very wide. Um, if you try and look at someone who's doing a, a drop knee turn and they've got a, a very narrow stance, it's obviously not going to work um, because we actually need to shift our weight from the forward position to the backwards, uh, well, from over our front foot to over our back foot, and that's really, really important. And when we have a narrow stance, we just don't have the space. And so I like to think about the, the broader that stance is, the better, especially as we're learning, because that's also a really, really good position to come into if we're going to stay nice and balanced. And the way that we're going to do this is as we're coming into this position, so we're going to make sure that our weight stays forward as we're shifting or correcting our back foot position. If we uh, bring our weight backwards as we adjust our back foot position, uh, it's going to be really, really tricky. We might not know how much weight to put on the tail, and if we've got all of our weight going straight back onto the tail, that's gonna be another issue that's gonna muck up our turn a little bit. So what we wanna do is we actually wanna have the chest forwards over the front knee, and then we're going to do a toe poke towards the tail. That toe poke, again, is gonna make sure that our foot isn't diagonal across the stringer, but that toe and the heel go straight along the stringer. Super, super important. And you can practice this really, really well on land. So as you're broadening your stance and you're bringing that back foot back, making sure that our weight stays forwards over the front foot, make contact with your toes, and then you're gonna shift that weight slowly back and easing more and more weight onto that back foot only as you need. If we go through a bit of an example here, what we can see is that, so this is the normal position that our feet will be in. My front foot is going to be angled, and then as we bring that back foot backwards, we're gonna broaden that stance. The hips are going to come and face forward. That's another really important point. And then we're going to just place the toe or the ball of our foot on the board. There will be no midfoot or heel contact onto the board for a drop knee turn. And that's something that again, can leave people stuck. Now, there's two ways of doing this. We can lean the, our chest over our back, back foot and inadvertently, that'll place a fair bit of pressure onto the tail. This is the way that I really like to start. And for anyone who is new to the drop knee turn, I'd really like you to start that way as well. The other way is where you physically press down hard with your back foot. Now, what you're going to need to do there is make sure that the board is also on rail, because if you're trying to do a big turn and push uh, and put, apply pressure through that back foot into the tail, if your board's not on rail, we're just gonna be pushing water. So we're just gonna be pushing the board down into the water, which we know is our stalling mechanism. We need to make sure if we are applying a lot of pressure through the tail, that our board is on edge so that we can push that board out and away from us, placing it on rail so that it can speed through the turn, making sure that's on rail again and not flat into the water where we're just gonna push. Essentially, it's gonna force it to be like an anchor and stop the board completely in its tracks. So if we're going out to practice the, the drop knee turn, that's the first thing I'd like you to focus on. So those two or three things. Um, then what I'd like you to do is to come back to what we're gonna talk about next, which is, our, which is our compression. This is a little bit more advanced and it's probably the second biggest thing that I see going wrong with the drop knee turn. Um, but this is when we're starting to execute the, the turn in different sections and we've got a good understanding of how to make that shape and being comfortable with making the shape of the drop knee turn too. So let's step through to that now. So the compression for the drop knee turn, this is probably the biggest thing that I see people missing when they do the drop knee turn and uh, really what happens is people stay really compressed into the, so they come into a really, really low drop knee turn no matter what section they're in. This is something that I was uh, a culprit of at the start coming and I wanted to do a big turn like Ray Leave, like Joel Tudor, all of these people that were just the absolute experts at this. Um, but what you actually find 
is to make a drop knee turn really deep and to come down and drop that knee low and get that knee actually close to the board, we need a section that can then allow us to extend out of that position. If we're in a slow, fat part of the wave, there is no way that we're gonna be able to extend out of that position properly. And if we are, like we spoke about before, if we push really hard um, to extend our knees and become a little bit straighter uh, from that really low bent down position, we're just gonna bog and we're just gonna push the board into the water, again, acting as a bit of an anchor. What we need to do is just slowly ease that wake back over the back foot, but we don't want to drop that knee low. So this is a variation of the drop knee turn. That knee is not gonna be super, super bent, but it's gonna lightly apply a bit of pressure to the tail without putting too much in so that it slows the board down too much. It's a safety turn and it's a really good way to go about practicing the drop knee turn. And this is where I like to start with things. Now, when can we apply a lot of pressure and how do we go about doing that? For the bigger drop knee turns and the turns where we're going to exert a lot of power, what we actually want to do is we want to do everything we said at the start. And then what we want to do is we want to come into a low position, but from this low position, so our knee is pretty close to the board, what we then need to do is we need to make sure we're tilting over the side of the rail and then we're pushing through that back foot. So we're trying to extend that back foot out. If you imagine my elbow here uh, is, is the leg and it's bent right now and then this is the water that we're trying to push against, we need to push that tail down to extend. We're not gonna be able to do that if we don't put up the board on rail because we're not, we can't push the board all the way down into the ocean. So therefore we need to make sure that we are leaning over the side of the rail first. So we're gonna tilt the board first. From there, we're in a low compressed position, knees almost touching the board. Then we're going to push that board and it's gonna send it outwards and we're gonna be able to extend that knee. And that's gonna be the driving force to accelerate through a big drop knee turn. You can definitely get stuck or caught doing those drop knee turns in lighter sections, in slower sections. And so it's really important to know the difference there to be able to go and say, hey, this is a slow section. I'm just gonna ease into this turn. I'm gonna do a, I'm gonna do a drop knee, but it's, I'm gonna take it nice and lightly. And then understanding in a critical section when it's nice and fast and you're able to place the board on rail in the critical section, that's when you can go, I'm gonna go all out, all out here. I'm gonna place that board on rail first, get low and then extend out with my back foot. And if you haven't seen through the, or we didn't make note of this when you were watching the drop knee edit before, make sure you go back and watch because my chest is very rarely all the way over my back foot. We're very rarely stepping and putting all of our weight onto the tail. Quite often I'm using that uh, back foot push uh, because I'm in a more critical section and I can actually keep that weight relatively forward, which is a good stable position and, make, and I can really filter how much weight I want to transfer onto that back foot there. So um, I hope that makes sense. If you have any questions about that, please let me know. Um, it's a really, really important thing to understand. Again, focus on that first section first. So focus on making sure you have the stance down pat first. Um, and then what we'll do is when you're looking at the compression side of things, start with a more of an up tall uh, stance so that uh, you're not compressing too hard. You can do that in any section. Then when you're gonna force through some uh, drop knee cutbacks, that's when you, or, or drop knee bottom turns, that's when you can start to get low, angle the board, put it on its rail and push hard and see how that goes. Um, so I hope that's helpful. What we'll do now is we'll step into tip time. Really good question for this week. So um, let's get straight into that. All right guys, so stepping into tip time. Now this is a section where I take questions from you guys, from the comments that you leave below, and we take a deep dive into those questions. So the first question here today is from Calvin. Again, another fantastic question, and one that I think is often missed. So the question is, should you buy a, uh, a different length longboard based on how big your steps are? Now, there's a few different components to this, but just to make it nice and simple to start with, and then we'll break into why. Um, no, I don't think we actually need to uh, buy a specific board. And again, this is my personal opinion. So uh, definitely feel free to ask other people and also find what works for you. But in my opinion, I don't think we need to buy a specific board depending on how big your steps are. Now, the reason for this is because I don't think we should be stuck into, into only doing one size step with your uh, cross steps. 
If you've uh, talked to me, you've had coaching from me, you'll know that I'm very adamant on being able to be very flexible with the cross steps. Um, and specifically, we actually do different size steps on different parts of the board. Um, so I think, yeah, wanting to make sure that, uh, I guess we're considering that our steps shouldn't always be the exact same length. And if they are, I think a lot of the time we're gonna get stuck. We're gonna get in places where our foot is just shy from the nose, or we're gonna be stepping uh, in ways that place us in really difficult positions of the boards with just little steps and yeah I think it uh, can cause a few more problems than it solves by just having one fixed cross step length. What I will say here though is I think it's really important to make sure that you get a board or feel a size of board that works for you. So for example I ride mostly 9.4s now, there's a few reasons for that. I feel like it's a really good medium between not being too little, not being too small, so it still has a really nice glide, a really nice loggy sort of feel. But at the other, other end of the spectrum, it's not like a 9.8 or a 10 footer, where it is a bit uh, heavy and cumbersome to be able to draw some pretty critical turns on it. Um, so I find that works for me. Now, if I'm considering going from, let's make it a bigger example. So if I'm going from my typical 9.4 all the way through to a 10 footer, an 11 footer, something like that, my steps are going to need to change quite a bit. And that's where there might be some learning phase um, to make sure that I can actually space my steps out correctly. For someone who is just learning cross stepping, that might be a little bit trickier as well. And you might not want to be correcting your step length all of the time, especially if you're still finding, you're trying to get your feet with it, you're trying to get your balance. And so I think if you can actually pick a, a board size that works for you, so it nose rides the way you want it to. Uh, it doesn't feel too, again, want to use the word cumbersome there, but I, I love the way a heavy log feels. So it's not necessarily that, but it doesn't feel like it's limiting you too much in terms of the weight and the size. Um, and it's allowing you to do the turns that you want to do. So for me, that's 9.4. For you, that might be a 9.1. Or uh, if you're younger, so a 9.1, that's what I rode when I was really young. And then if you're um, maybe a bit taller or a bit heavier, maybe those uh, upper ranges in the, uh, in the length might work for you. Um, but yeah, I would say pick a size and if you're liking it, stick with that size. So stick with that size that you usually, uh, that you usually surf. And there, then when you're going from board to board, it will actually really help for you to gauge how your steps should feel. And there won't be that new learning effect that you might be required to do each time you step onto a new board. If you're going from a 9.1 to a 9.6 to a 9.3 to a 10 footer, um, it'll all be, uh, I guess, relatively similar. And then there's just the other intricacies and the nuances uh, to do with how the board feels and how it turns and responds, um, how it nose rides that you'll need to figure out. But that cross stepping can always be a bit of a, a staple that you've got there. Um, if you've got the I guess same size board each time. Uh, thanks Calvin so much for the question. Uh, really appreciate you dropping that in the comments. Um, I think it was a really good one to delve into. Um, there's a few more that I want to get uh, into, but uh, if you leave your uh, comments or questions uh, for tip time in the next videos below, I'll have a read through. Um, we'll have a bit of a discussion about them and then I, I might answer them in the next one. So that'll be good. I think that's it for the edit today. Again, thanks so much for the support. As I mentioned at the start of the video, really, really appreciate it. And uh, hope you guys are getting waves and we'll see you in the next one in a week's time. Phew.